Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and as always, I am happy to be with you to be discussing books and doing an author interview to share with you, always one of my favorite things. This episode is airing on August 31st, which just happens to be Risa's birthday, so now I can't call her my 10-year-old niece anymore. I have to call her my 11-year-old niece. She was, if you listened to last Tuesday's episode, then you heard me talk about my anniversaries. And yes, she was born one week after my first date with my husband. I had, uh, we, ha- we had our first date and then I said, hey, this was great. I'm leaving. <laughs> so my sister had asked me if I would come be with their older daughter uh, during the birth of Risa. She was a scheduled C-section. She is adopted and it was an open adoption. So... My brother and my my brother in law and my sister went to the hospital to be there uh, for you know once the birth was once the C section was over they would they would get Risa and so I entertained five year old Maya at the hotel and we had a we had a, a great time she actually remembers little bits and pieces of it which is funny to hear her memories but so yeah a week after our first date then Risa was born which means that she was uh, a week shy of being two when we got married which means that she was freaking adorable but at any rate it's her birthday I love her I wish her happy birthday we celebrated about 10 days ago when um she and her family were able to come to my parents' house for uh, the day, and so that was fun. And now we're going to talk about books, which is something that she would love anyway. So let's talk about today's author interview. I am speaking with D. Eric Mikrans about his novel, The Resurrectionist Papers. It is the first in a series, and I'm going to read you the back because, I, well, I, I've sort of explained it at the end of the last episode, but let me just read you what the back says. Discovered as three notebooks in an antique store in Rome at the turn of the millennium, the Reincarnationist Papers offers a tantalizing glimpse into the Cognomia, a secret society of people who possesses total recall of their past lives. Evan Michaels struggles with being different with having the complete memories of two other people who lived sequentially before him. He fights loneliness and believes he is unique until he meets Poppy. She recognizes his struggle because she is like him, except that she is much older, and remembering seven consecutive lives. But there is something else she must share with Evan. She is a member of the secretive Cognomia. They are, in effect, immortals compiling experiences and skills over lifetimes into near superhuman abilities that they have used to drive history over centuries. Poppy invites Evan into the Cognomia, but he must face their tests before entering this mysterious society as their equal. And that is the description of The Resurrectionist Papers by D. Eric Mikrans. As I mentioned also at the end of the last episode, it is the basis for uh, a movie called Infinite, that movie stars Mark Wahlberg and Chiwetel Ejiofor. I have not seen it yet, but it is out. Um, I think it's streaming. And so, you know, if that's something that you want to check out uh, after after you read the book, before you read the book, however that might work for you. It's also an audiobook, and I had a chance to listen to part of the audiobook as well as doing some reading. And um, it has two narrators. Michael David Axtell reads all of the footnotes, and there are footnotes included throughout the book. And then the narrator, the main narrator, is Bronson Pinchot. And I'm probably showing my age, but I don't care because when I think Bronson Pinchot, I think Perfect Strangers from the, was it? 
late 80s, early 90s, or just 80s. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. But he played Balky, and he would do the Dance of Joy. <laughs> and so I have this very definite image in my head. But he's really good. There are a lot of people from a lot of different places in this book. And he is great with accents. He's good with voices. And so he did a really wonderful job of doing the accents, doing the voices, making sure that I knew who was speaking even before it you know the 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 narrative maybe said who was doing the speaking so um, if you are a fan of audiobooks I would definitely recommend checking this out but if you're a fan of books such as this with you know some very interesting immortal almost immortal lives and uh, there's some flashbacks to past lives etc I am starting to ramble and so I'm going to turn this over to Eric so he can tell you more about the book and the notebooks and all of those good things so here is the interview with D Eric Mikrans. Hi Eric welcome to the podcast. Uh, hi Sarah thanks for having me. I am very excited to have you. We are here to talk about your novel, The Reincarnationist Papers. Um, before we get to the book, though, if you could start by sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm calling you today from Denver, Colorado, which is uh, for most of the past 30 something years, I think the first couple of years of Europe. Um, I am a, in my day job, I am an IT professional over for Silicon Valley firm, but have been writing on and off for, wow, close to 25 years now. Um, I wrote for the Denver Post for a while. I wrote two nonfiction tour guide books to Italy when I had the opportunity to live in Italy. And the Reincarnationist Papers is my debut novel. And it has been, I'm very fortunate, it has been adapted into the Paramount movie Infinite, starring Mark Wahlberg, and there's quite a, and there's quite a wonderful story around how that happened. Uh, but that's, that's a little bit about myself. All right, thank you for that. And I'm going to pause here and say that you're cutting out a little bit. I'm not sure if it's the, if it's the, um, the Bluetooth head, headphones or not, but can we try without? Yes, I will have to hang on a second. <clears throat> Let me try that, and I can start over if we need to. Hang on. Okay, we may need to. It wasn't bad, but I think there were a couple of words that might have dropped. So let me place this up a little bit. How's that sound? Um, it sounds okay right now. Let's see how, uh, it, do you mind answering that first question again, and then I'll, I'll, we'll see how it sounds? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm just, I have you on, uh, just on the speaker, and I've got the, uh, I've got the phone elevated so that I can speak right into it like a microphone. Okay, right now, uh, right now you're sounding pretty good, so. Okay, great. Let's do this then. All right, uh, so go ahead and um, tell me a little bit about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling you today from Denver, Colorado, which is where I have lived for um, the majority of the last 30 years. I did have the opportunity to live in Europe for a couple of years. Um, my day job is in IT. I actually work for a Silicon Valley software firm and have uh, been doing that for 20 years. I'm actually on a bit of a sabbatical right now to promote uh, my debut novel. And, uh, but, you know, bef before I wrote the reincarnation papers, I'd actually written, um, you know, back into the, you know, the mid to late 90s. I, I was, uh, I was a writer for the Denver Post. I was a correspondent when I lived in Rome. I actually uh, was able to get a contract to write two nonfiction books about Italy when I lived there. And when I came back here, I started working in earnest on the Reincarnations Papers, which is my debut novel, which I'm very fortunate that it has been adapted into the Paramount movie Infinite, starring Mark Wahlberg, Dylan O'Brien, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Toby Jones, and Sophie Cookson. And there's actually a wonderful story around how that, uh, about how the Reincarnations Papers became Infinite. 
Thank you. Yes, and I do want to talk about the movie, but I want to talk about the book first. So if you can give a, a bit of an overview of the Reincarnationist Papers. Sure. The Reincarnationist Papers is the story about a young man. Uh, his name is Evan Michaels, who is troubled by memories of two past lives. And when I say memories of two past lives, imagine total recall, Sarah. Skills, languages, experiences, everything. And he thinks, he struggles because he thinks that his existence is sort of unique and that he's alone in the world. But that all changes when he accidentally stumbles onto, into a woman named Poppy who is exactly like him. And, and except that she remembers back seven lives. And then she turns Evan's world upside down by introducing him into a secret society of others like them who have been associating with one another for centuries and have been sort of quiet drivers to history behind the scenes. Yeah, it's, it's it's interesting because he is a teenager when he starts remembering these past lives. And like you said, it's not just sort of bits and pieces. It's it's total recall. <laughs> I mean, even to the fact that I, he seems to start smoking because of the one life of in the, the guy who, um, he two lives before, and he smokes the same exactly. kind of cigarette. So um, can you talk a little bit more about Evan and what about him you think might resonate with readers? So, you know, Evan is, like a lot of us, um, you know, on a journey of self-discovery and, you know, figuring out who he really is. And we tend to find, we tend to advance ourselves on those journeys through new introductions, meeting people who challenge us, who catalyze us in, in different ways. And that's what happens to Evan when he meets Poppy and then when he meets Samus, and then when he meets Clovis and the other members of the secret society, and the secret society is called a cognomena based in Zurich, Switzerland. And so we get to know these other characters and how the secret society works through Evan mm -hmm. and, and his, and, and his uh, you know, and, and his induction into the secret society, if he can pass their tests. Right, right. And... Um... It's interesting. I'm I'm trying to imagine the writing process here in that you have characters to keep track of, but these characters all have multiple lives. <laughs> um, yes. So was it a particular challenge to keep track of those those characters and all of the incarnations of their characters? Yes, I, I have a I have a giant spreadsheet that I use to keep track of everybody. You know, if you can imagine, you know, how, you know, somebody like George R. R. Martin, right, has to keep track of all of his characters, or Tolstoy keeping track of hundreds of characters in War and Peace, right? I have a cheat sheet that I use to keep track of all of the characters, because you, you bring up a great point, sir. One of the things that we do in the Reincarnation Papers, one, one of the things that I do as the author, is that I, I interject, uh, you know, three or four flashback chapters where we'll explore one of the characters like Evan or Poppy or Samus or Clovis in a previous incarnation where something happened to them that, you know, defines their character or gives them some character traits that we're seeing manifest with Evan in the present day. So it is, it is a bit of a challenge to keep it all together, but that's actually one of the things that I loved about writing the book is that I get to write about these characters and explore their development over a much longer timeline than you can with normal character. Let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, Eric will be talking about why he likes to write about this particular subject matter, reincarnation, past lives almost immortals, etc. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. I'm here to tell you about the Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all in one dryer brush. I just took this traveling with me, and it is amazing in that it is 
a three-in-one tool. I didn't have to pack extra equipment with me just for my hair on this trip. It has a hair dryer. It is a volumizer. It is a detangler. It can do all of these things in one step. The large oval brush creates glam, waves, the bristles painlessly remove knots as you dry and style. It uses ionic technology to create a frizz-free look effortlessly. Speaking of that frizz-free look, there are three heat settings plus a cool setting that will lock in your look for effortless looking hairstyles. It's got a bonus volumizing attachment included that gives you added lift at the roots and the removable attachments make storage at home or away super easy. Like I said, I just traveled with it and it was so easy and so convenient. If you would like your very own Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all-in-one dryer brush, simply go to conair.com and search dryer brush. Again, that is conair, C-O-N-A-I-R dot com and search dryer brush. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author D. Eric Mikrans about his novel, which is the first in a series. That novel is called The Resurrectionist Papers. Let's get back to that interview. What do you think about this particular, it's not exactly a genre, subject matter, let's say subject matter draws you to writing about, um, you know, past lives, reincarnation, etc.? Well, it was it was it was a combination of 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 two things initially, and then there's been this overarching thought that has been I keep it as a quote on my desk that it's been guiding me from the beginning. Uh, the first idea is, you know, Sarah, we've all heard this saying, "Oh my gosh, if I only knew then." When I was 18 or 20, what I know when I'm 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, right, I would have made better decisions, you know, I would have made better choices, I would have made different investments in myself and my relationships. And then I, and I took that to its extreme and I thought, what would it be like if they could be hundreds of years old? And they would get that way by having a total recall of their past lives. What would that be like? What would those characters be like if they were in an 18 or 20-year-old body and had the memories and the experiences of a 120-year-old or a 360-year-old? I thought, man, that would be really, those would be really interesting characters to write about. And I hope that they're really interesting characters to read about. So that, that was one idea. The second idea is and this gets a little weird and metaphysical, but um, Sarah, I actually have three short memories that don't belong to me. They predate me. Uh, huh. They're very short. They're they're in first person, just like any memories that I any other memories that I've had. I've always had them, and I don't know what to do with them. Uh, I don't know if that proves anything about past lives or reincarnation. Uh, but I know that they're there, and they're like sort of an uncatalogued file that I have to deal with. And then I took that idea to its extreme, and I thought, well, what if you didn't just remember like these little memory shards, but what if you could remember the entire life, like everything that that person had done? What would that do to your experience and your personality when you remembered a completely other personality and would you become an amalgam of the two? Would you become, would you still become the first person who had transcended into this life? Or would this life sort of supersede and just absorb the knowledge and experience of the past life? 
And many of the reincarnationists had sort of different takes on that and different paths going through. So it was the combination of those two things, Sarah, that was really the genesis for the reincarnationist papers. But as I was writing about Evan um, and, and these characters, I found this wonderful quote that I keep on my desk. It's by um, a 19th century American. He was a noted um, transcendentalist and spiritualist in New England called Frederick Henry Hedge. And the quote is this, uh, every man is his own ancestor and every man his own heir. He devises his own future and he inherits his own past. And what, you know, what, 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 you know what, what Mr. Hedge is talking about there is how we're sort of different people at different phases in our lives. We're babies, we're children, we're students, we're workers, we're parents, we're grandparents, we're retirees. And each thing that we do at each stage sort of prepares us for the next part of our life. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know I, I feel like I am, you know, was able to write this book because I had studied Russian literature at the University of Colorado. So in a way, that's like an inheritance that my 22-year-old self gave my 42-year-old self when I started, you know, uh, really working on this book in earnest. And I, 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 I played that, but, it, but it's, it actually works really well when you have lives, when you have characters to remember their past lives, because then you can actually have them bequeath their knowledge and even their wealth to a future self to really um, advance their their lives and who they're going to be in the future. Wow, fascinating. Um, it definitely, you know, we have sayings that we, we use all the time that, um, for instance, um, when, you, when you're talking to a small child, you will say something like they have an old soul. Um, <laughs> and I just feel like, you know, that that's kind of sounds a lot like what the characters go through, although they don't remember their lives until they are a little older. But also I'm thinking of myself at... 16, 17, 18, <laughs> thinking, wow, teenage years are hard enough without having to then remember 500 years of other people, not other people, but, you know, my past experiences. Not sure how I would feel about that. Exactly. Hence the troubled young man part. Exactly. Um, did you do any particular types of research for the book? So I did a lot of research for this book, and the research broke down into a couple of different areas. Number one, I did a lot of research on reincarnation in general, and the research in reincarnation breaks down into, um, into three basic camps. There are there's there's sort of the Eastern religious camp of reincarnation that is very fundamental to Buddhism and Hinduism, and you know that's very well established. There's another um, part of reincarnation research that I did that um, I, it's you know deals with people who are having you know. Um, you know, regression therapy sessions, uh, hypnotherapy sessions where they're recalling things that, you know, happened to them or ostensibly their transcending personality, um, you know, before this incarnation. And those are, those are interesting, but not necessarily that compelling to me. And then I found some research around reincarnation that was academic in nature. And this was led primarily out of the University of Virginia by a doctor by the name of Ian Stevenson. And um, uh, it was started in the 1960s. And it's about, and, and Dr. Stevenson's research was finding cases, almost always it was children, where they had memories uh, and, and relayed experiences to their parents from things that didn't happen to them, happened before they were born to other people. 
And then Dr. Stevenson's research is actually unique in that he was actually able to go back and verify those facts that the children remember. And most of his research takes place in India, Sri Lanka, um, um, and native tribes to Alaska and indigenous peoples there. And uh, there are some actually in Europe as well that are actually quite compelling. And this research was like really fascinating to me. And it's, and it's wonderful reading. And the research has actually been continued by his, uh, his successor at the University of Virginia, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Jim Tucker. And uh, Dr. Tucker has a lot of books and has continued Dr. Stevenson's research in this space. And that really guided me on how I should structure how people should remember, how much they should remember, how you would verify if someone did remember, i.e. if you're going to allow someone into a secret society where everybody remembers their past lives, how would you verify that? Uh, that was actually really interesting research for me. Uh, and then the other part of the research was all of the historical research that I did to place these reincarnationist characters in World War I, in 17th century uh, France, in 16th century uh, American Southwest as a conquistador, in uh, 17th century Middle East uh, working with or against the, uh, uh, the British East India Trading Company. Um, all of that historical research went into the historical flashbacks to make them as accurate as possible. Uh, even to the point where I footnoted a lot of the research that went into those into those flashbacks. It's an interesting process to me to think about a, a secret society as described in the book and how you would prove that you did have these memories. Um, you, you know, with with the internet now, I'm sure it would be easier to fake. I, I'm intrigued by that. This is not a I don't want to give too much away about the book, but there's a part where Poppy is telling Evan about how originally you just somebody would stab you and then you had to come back 18 years later and identify your murderer. Um, and I thought, wow, exactly. I, I guess that would definitely deter people who wanted to get in under false pretenses. Exactly, exactly. That's the, yeah, yeah, that was the, the crude way of doing it. Yes, yes. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you have these three memories that aren't yours, are and, and that kind of influenced some of your writing. Are there any autobiographical elements in your writing? Uh, other than being able to identify, you know, what it was like to be, you know, a, a young man who struggled with acceptance and finding a peerage, um, and, you know, some of my experiences with travel and visiting some of the places that I detail uh, either in the book, uh, in, in different geographies or in different timelines. Um, no, that, that and just, you know, the, the idea of, you know, hey, if you had three memory shards, what would it be like if you remembered three complete lives? Uh, that's pretty much all the autobi autobiographical elements in the book. Uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't follow Evan down any of his other dark paths. Let's put it that way. Good. <laughs> um, I know that writing can be uh, a difficult process in terms of you know editing and doing everything that it takes to actually bring a, a book to fruition. But uh, what are some of your what were some of your favorite parts about writing this novel? So I love writing the historical flashback chapters. Um, each one of them ends up being sort of like a mini story or a short story within the novel where we get to explore a different time and a different place with the same characters and we get to you know, perhaps discover how some personality traits that we see in that character today were started or created or a consequence of something that happened centuries ago. Uh, I think that's just a lot of fun. I like doing the historical research and trying to really bring the reader into that time period, into that, into that place. 
that's very rewarding for me. The other thing that's really rewarding for me, and if you interview enough writers, you probably hear some say this, is when your characters surprise you. You know, when you're writing a scene or you're writing about a character and you're just so in the zone with them and what you're doing that the character seems to make a decision in your writing that is completely consistent with how you've written them before, but seems to come out of left field from where you are creatively in that moment. And that seems like just like some spark of magic that happens. And it doesn't happen every day, it doesn't happen every week, but it does happen often enough to sort of make you look behind the chair to see if there's a muse behind your shoulder uh, that's sort of whispering in your ear. And when those when those things happen when I'm writing, that's really magical. I don't know if we should worry about AI taking over, you know, becoming sentient and taking over. We We should probably worry about the fictional characters that keep making their own decisions <laughs> taking over. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, my 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 uh my AI my AI worries are mostly around robotics. Yes. Regular listeners are going to know that I am never going to let a joke go by or the opportunity to joke about AI taking over the world and killing us or apparently now fictional characters taking over and killing us. That's just my weird sense of humor apparently. Let's take a break, and when we come back, more with Eric. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. fictional characters. Awesome. Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> I am speaking today with D. Eric Mikrans about his novel, The Resurrectionist Papers. Let's get back to that interview. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the movie Infinite because it's it's very cool that your your debut novel has been made into a motion picture, with a major motion picture with a really great cast. I mean, uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor is one of my favorite actors. So how did that come about? So this came about through the through a crazy idea that I tried. So uh, the reincarnation of papers was uh, was relaunched this year by my publisher, Blackstone Publishing, uh, and it's been it's available in print, ebook, and audio on Audible.com. And but the the book I'd actually I had actually tried to get the book published in an earlier version in 2008, and I I shared it with a bunch of readers and they liked it, uh, and I tried to go out and get an agent and I got an agent for another book project, but then she didn't want to work on this project, and I tried to find other agents and it just never worked. But the more I shared with readers, the more I, you know, the more feedback I kept getting, hey, this is really good. I really like this book. I really want to read more. This is really a fascinating take that you've had on this. And so I knew that the book was good, and I knew that readers were enjoying the book. And But, you know, I struggled to get an agent. I struggled to get a publishing deal. This is not an unusual story, right? Uh, J.K. Rowling got rejected. James Patterson got rejected. All these writers got rejected. 
Um, and but I, I I sort of took a different track from there, and I borrowed a page from my day job. And as I said at the top of this call, Sarah, my day job is working in IT and software development in Silicon Valley. And one of the things that we do in software development is a, a technique called crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing is where you define the goal of what you want to see happen, and then you invite end users, customers, readers to contribute in their own way. Um, a great example of that is Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia is a crowdsourced endeavor that we all work on and we all help out each other and we all peer review each other's work toward a common goal of a worldwide encyclopedia. Um, so what I did is I decided to offer my readers the reward of the agent's commission if any reader read the book and loved the book and would introduce the book to a Hollywood producer who would adapt it into a movie. And I posted that reward on the very first page of the book. So when you crack open the cover, the first thing you see is a big bold letters reward at the top of the page. And then it walks you through what I'm asking the reader to do. And so basically what I did is I empowered my early readers to become an army of agents for me that then took this book out to um, several places. And one of the places that the book landed was with a, a, a young uh, assistant to a Hollywood director who was between projects, and he actually found a copy of the Reincarnationist Papers in a hostel in Nepal. Somebody had left the book there, and he read it, read the reward, loved the book, and contacted me to say, hey, has anybody claimed this reward? Because I can totally get this made into a movie. And like I said, the reward sounded like a crazy idea right up until it worked. And little did I know that it would have to go halfway around the world to Nepal to work. But uh, this young man, his name was Rafi. Uh, Rafi went to work um, and pitched it to several studios. It actually took several years, but it eventually landed at Paramount Pictures, where they attached Antoine Fuqua to direct the picture, and then Mark Wahlberg joined, Chi Wattel joined, uh, Dylan O'Brien joined, and they started filming it in 2019. Uh, I actually got to go on set to see it being filmed, and it was released uh, earlier this year. Uh, it was released, it'll be uh, almost two months ago today. It'll be two months ago in four days. Uh, it was released uh, by Paramount on Paramount+. Plus. That there are so many elements of that that are just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> just the fact that it was found in a hostel in Nepal. I mean, that's wow. And then uh, I also love that it's out, so any you know listeners can read the book and watch the movie, uh, or in whatever order they prefer. Um, I know people get very opinionated on which order you should do that, <laughs> but I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> not going to make any statements on that. So that's really awesome that it uh, it worked out that way. Um, in terms of writing, are you working on a new project now? So it was about, it was about two weeks ago that I finished draft eight of the sequel to the Reincarnationist Papers, it's called, it's tentatively titled The Cognomena Codex, and it'll be the second book in the Reincarnationist Papers series. There, there are at least four books in the series, and that book is with my agent now, my new agent, and uh, I hope to um, work with Blackstone Publishing again to be able to get that out to readers sometime in the next year. Awesome. And did you say that there were at least four books uh, potentially in the series? Exactly. There are at least four and potentially more than that. Okay. So do you have an arc in mind for the series as a whole? Um, or uh, So will you write 
to an endpoint, or is there room for more if uh, the ideas occur to you? Uh, so I'm writing toward an endpoint, but there could be some additional books in between here and the endpoint. All right. So you know, so book four actually could become book, you know, eight or nine with some other books in between. But I'm still working toward the end of the of that same arc, Sarah. Okay, thank you. You've mentioned writing for. Um, writing some nonfiction and those sorts of things. When did you know that you wanted to write? And also, when did you decide to try to write for fiction for publication? So um, I, I sort of knew that I wanted to uh, be a writer when I was at the University of Colorado. Um, you know, I studied Russian language and literature there. And, you know, so I cut my teeth on some of the big Russian giants, the Dostoevskys and the Tolstoys and the Pushkins. And I really just fell in love with the magic trick that they could do as authors um, with the collaboration of readers, you know, each reader taking that book and recreating that story in their own mind. That just, I just, as soon as that happened for me, I said, that's it what I want to do and it's, it's taken me a while to get there but um, that's when I first realized it and from your experience then do you have uh, advice for aspiring authors uh, I do um, I think that the I, I, the, I the, my advice breaks down into a couple of things number one is Writing is a habit, and you have to get into the habit of doing it every day, especially if you're going to write something that's novel length. Um, it's like climbing a mountain where every day you take just another footstep or two forward. And it takes a while, but you must be in the habit of writing every day. Uh, I, my goal is to write a 1,000 words a day. Uh, sometimes it's 800, sometimes it's 12 or 1400, but you do that for you know 90 or 120 days in a row, and you have something that looks like the first draft of a book. So it's there's there's a discipline about it that is sort of table stakes for writing anything big. Number two is it is get your stuff in front of readers. Um, Probably not your first draft, right? Have a second go at it. But putting your stuff in front of readers will tell you as an author if your stuff is good or not good, where it's good and where it's not good, where it needs to be improved in order to be good, and how much it needs to improve to be good enough to be on the shelf in a bookstore next to other books that those readers read and enjoy every day. And People, as I, you know, authors, and I was guilty of this, think that they can be an arbiter of that, but putting your stuff in front of readers and getting their feedback, finding a good beta reader team that you trust, it has been really key to me really upping the quality of my art and being able to elevate it to the point where, you know, hopefully, um, you know, this is, people appreciate it as commercially, uh, commercial quality work. One final break, and then when we come back, we'll be wrapping things up with Eric. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together, we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Welcome 
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author D. Eric Mikrans. Again, the book is The Resurrectionist Papers. Yeah, I would imagine that uh, being as immersed as you would have to be in order to write a novel, you can sometimes, you know, you, you've, you've spent so much time with it that you don't see things that outside readers would see. And, and that could be very helpful to have those other eyes. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's the readers are the most important people in the equation in my mind, right? People think that agents are, the publishers are, but, you know, readers are the ultimate bosses. They're the ultimate consumers of this, and they will vote whether the work is good or not good. And the earlier that you engage those those arbiters of success, uh, the easier I think the path is. It, it's, it'll seem harder because you'll be like, man, I thought this was good, and then everybody hated this. But they're <laughs> just telling you that they hate it because of something that, you know, needs work. Right, right. When you take the time to read for yourself, what um, authors and genres do you tend to turn towards? So um, I tend to like um, – I tend to like um, – uh, uh, just a handful of authors um, because I have, especially when I'm writing, I have a very narrow range of things that I can put into my head um, and have my writing still stay sort of on course with my own voice. Um, I, I like to read classic things. So one of the things that I read in the past year, maybe a little too right on the nose, Sarah, was I reread The Plague by Albert Camus. Um, and um, then the, the – I'm sorry, go ahead. I just said, oh, wow, uh, interesting choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I said, maybe a little too right on the nose, right? But um, – uh, I really, I really love reading Camus stuff. Uh, it really gets me into sort of the right mood and the right uh, voice in my head. Uh, Raymond Carver does the same thing for me. Reading short stories of his really get me locked into that space. Um, for pleasure, um, I'm sort of all over the map. I really like reading uh, Colson Whitehead. Uh, I just read Nickel Boys and uh, enjoyed that a lot. Uh, I really enjoy reading Cormac McCarthy. Uh, I really enjoy reading Chuck Palahniuk, uh, and that may sound and it may seem like a wide range, but Chuck Palahniuk is uh, I, I, I just something about that guy's imagination that really sings to me. Actually, I have. Um, you are not the first person that has mentioned um, Cormac McCarthy and, and Chuck Palahniuk in the same in the same question, answering the same question. So there's something about those two. That seems to draw a certain type of reader. Well, they're both they're both excellent American authors. Yes, yes. I think Cormac McCarthy might be the, the best American author alive. All right. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Um, website, social media, etc. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> the best place to reach me. And it's the best place because I will give you some super secret free stuff is at my website, ericmykranz.com, E-R-I-C, last name is M-A-I-K-R-A-N-Z. And on the on my homepage, you'll have the opportunity to sign up for my reader newsletter. And for people who sign up for my reader newsletter, I will give you some exclusive bonus content. And the bonus content includes some of the research that I did around reincarnation that we talked about earlier, specifically some of Dr. Ian Stevenson and Dr. Jim Chucker's use cases that are really fascinating. Uh, I include some third-party academic research in there into reincarnation as well as uh, as of today, I have one hidden chapter that you can get there, and it is chapter 7.5 to the Reincarnationist Papers, and it slips right in between chapter 7 and 8, but it's only available to people who sign up for my, uh, uh, for my reader newsletter at ericmycrans.com. And I will also be giving out short snippets and samples of the next book in the series, The Cognomena Codex, over the next couple of months. OK, 
Okay. I'm also on tw- I'm also on Twitter and Facebook. Okay. When you said 7.5, I had to grab the book and go to Chapter 8 and see how Chapter 7 ended and how Chapter 8 began. And that's a good place to uh, insert some extra information. <laughs> yeah, there's like a, you know, there's like a, a page and a half historical flashback there where, you know, one of the characters is talking to Evan about how she learned her glass craft. And mm-hmm. I basically... Um, I basically expand that into a full chapter. All right. Thank you. Well, Eric, we have talked about a variety of different things during our time together. Uh, Is there anything that we haven't covered, though, that you were hoping to mention during this interview? Um, I I just, you know, I I hope that, uh, you know, that your listeners will pick up a copy of the Reincarnationist Papers. Um, you know, it's available everywhere where books are sold, um, including online, but I'm a big fan of your local indie bookstore. Mine happens to be the Tattered Cover here in Denver. I think indie bookstores serve a very unique and valuable service in our communities, especially from the individual booksellers themselves and the recommendations that they have. Uh, so uh, I would encourage everybody to pick up a copy of the Reincarnation's Papers. Uh, if they're not sure they want to get started, they can also pick up a free prequel to the Reincarnation's Papers. It's called the Reincarnation's Papers Origins Prequel, and that is available exclusively on Amazon.com for Kindle, and that is a free novella that introduces them to the Cognomena and how the Reincarnation's papers got started. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time to talk to me about um, not only the Reincarnationist papers, but the story behind it and uh, a little bit of what's to come. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Sarah. It's been my pleasure to join you and uh, to be a guest on your book review podcast. Thank you once again to Eric for taking the time to talk to me about this book. It was a... Uh, Fat, well, yeah, I, mean, I I hesitate, not because I can't think of a good word. I just was thinking of too many words. It, fascinating. I mean, really interesting to see how all of these people who have known each other for hundreds of years interact and cope with what with the amount of memories that they have. One thing that I didn't mention at the beginning of the um, of the podcast, but that you probably gathered from the discussion of the book. There's a lot of philosophy in this novel. The characters, of course, all have different ideas of why they come back and uh, not everyone else in the world. And so that affects how they live their lives because they they either see it as a positive or a negative or some combination thereof. They have regrets from numerous past lives. They are trying to sort through a lot of different things. I mean, think about your own life and some of the things that you wish you could change. And maybe you come back and you can sort of change something. But there are things, of course, that will haunt you for well, eternity for some of these people. So there's a lot of philosophical conversations. And so if that's something that appeals to you, in addition to this idea of resurrection and near immortality, then you really should check out this book. If you're an audiobook fan, as I said, definitely check out the uh, the audio version. It is, I believe, still included in your Audible membership. So if you have an Audible membership, you can listen to this book for free, which is awesome. I love that. I mean, it's, you know, you're still paying your membership, but you know what I mean. <laughs> So thanks again to Eric. And again, the book is The Resurrectionist Papers. Thank you again to all of you for taking the time to listen to this interview. Hope you will join me for next week. We have um, Shapeshifter story, but not your typical kind of alpha shapeshifter. In fact, the uh, the tagline on the back of the book says, Alpha Wolf Beta Human, Big Apple. It is A Canadian Werewolf in New York by Mark Leslie, and it's the first in a series also, so we're going into the world of fantasy, but um, Beta Human. This is not your typical wolf, shifter, predator, you know, alpha male kind of kind of man. You'll have to tune in to hear more about the main character in this book, Michael Andrews. So please join me for that. In the meantime, 
again, hope you're having a great day. End of August, we're transitioning into a new month already. But um, no matter what you're doing, I hope that your day involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.